But that's not the only thing that matters. There's also heat absorption patterns. Um, water tends to reflect a lot of the sunlight. And so a lot of the energy that hits the Earth gets reflected back to space because a lot of the Earth is made up of water. And a lot of the atmosphere also blocks a lot of sunlight, all the clouds and things like that. So a lot of the energy that hits the Earth never actually goes into the ecosystems. But land tends to absorb heat faster than water does. Water takes a lot to heat up. It's the whole thing about the specific heat of water. We're going to learn more about that later in the year. But it's a property of water that makes water... Uh, actually heat up very slowly because there's very strong bonds compared to other chemicals. It's actually weak bonds, the hydrogen bonds, but there's so many of them that it makes it very hard for water to heat up. And so that means that water tends to maintain its temperature. So when the sun is hitting the earth, which area is going to warm up the most? The land or the water? The land. The land will heat up faster than the water will. Then, at night, when the sun is no longer hitting the earth, which area cools down the fastest? Remember, water does not like to change temperature, which means the water will stay warmer longer and the, the land will cool down faster. A lot of different things will happen because of this. By the way, uh, ice is even more reflected than water is. So the more ice you have in the world, the colder the world actually is. Not because the ice is literally chilling the world, but because the more ice you have, the more light from the sun goes back into space. But if the ice starts to melt, then less light is reflected and the, and the earth warms up. So as the ice caps and glaciers are all melting around the world, that's actually making the world even warmer because less sunlight is being reflected into space because the ice is very, very reflective. You see what I mean there? Okay. Now, the whole thing that I just described about heat absorption patterns makes it so that wind patterns will occur. For example, the famous land and ocean breezes. The fact that the, war, the, the land warms up faster than the, land, the, the, the water makes it so that during the day, there's going to be a low pressure zone over the land and a high pressure zone of the water because the water is going to be colder and cold air tends to sink and it's compressed, it's heavier, it sinks. So it's going to be high pressure there. Meanwhile, on top of the land, there's low pressure because it's hotter and it tends to expand. It lowers the density, the air tends to go up. That makes so that there's going to be a circulation pattern like you see in the picture on the top left there. That means that the hot air will rise over the land and then it will be pushed towards the, the water all the way over the top there, sink back again because it gets colder when it gets up there, and then it hits the cold water and blows towards the land. Now what this means is that air usually blows from high pressure to low pressure. So this means that during the day, at high altitudes, the air blows towards the water, but at low altitudes, the air blows towards the land meaning that you have a constant breeze towards the land. So if you live close to the water, it's nice because it's going to be this breeze that's constantly coming from the water. Very important factor in climate. People who are uh, ecosystems which live close to the water are going to have this constant breeze and it's nice. Now during the night, the opposite happens because the land cools down faster than the water does. So the water is going to be hotter than the land. So the cold Cold air is over the land, so that's where the high pressure is, and the low pressure is over the water. So now it inverts. So during the night, you have what's called a land breeze that blows towards the water. And similar processes occur between valleys and mountains. During the day, the, the valleys are going to be warmed up so much that the air is going to rise and then sink afterwards. But during the night, the opposite occurs, and the, the mountains are going to cool down faster because they're made of land. So these are patterns of wind that occur because of what's happening in the, uh, in the, with the, this, the whole absorption pattern that I just described. Now something similar also occurs during monsoons. And monsoons, of course, are very important for ecosystems because if you're going to be hit by water six months at a time and then six months you're going to be dry, that's going to affect what kind of ecosystem lives there. Like India, for example, is hit by this monsoon. See, India is in a smaller ocean, the Indian Ocean. So that Indian Ocean uh, warms up really, really fast. It has currents that mess the water around, but they don't distribute the water too much the way the, the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans, which are larger. So there's less movement of water in the Indian Ocean, and that's going to be a factor here about why there's so many monsoons over there. But it's a similar thing that we just talked about with the land and water breeze. During the summer months, okay, the Land is really, really hot. So it happens the same way as the, as the ocean breeze we talked about before. Air will constantly blow from the ocean towards the land. But the thing is, is this, this air that's coming from the ocean, it's probably full of evaporation. 
So what's going to happen, it's going to rain constantly over during the summer on top of the land. But during the winter, the opposite happened. The land gets colder than the water does, and so the, the water, the wind constantly blows towards the ocean. Now, this means that the wind is constantly blowing away from the land, and that means water or rain never goes towards the land, and which means for six months of winter, it doesn't rain at all. While during the summer, since water is constantly coming with the wind from the ocean, it rains constantly all the time. And this only happens more often in the Indian Ocean because the ocean doesn't change its temperature too much during the, that month because it's, it's, it doesn't rotate in currents as much as other oceans do. And that creates this pattern of monsoons, of six months of constant rain and then months of constant drought. And that obviously is going to make a, uh, determine what kind of life is going to live there because that life is going to have to deal with those kinds of things. Now, in this video, we're talking about heat absorption. Now, another pattern that's like that is the El Nino pattern. The sun goes through processes where it will go to maximums and minimums, which means that there are some times where the sun is angrier than other times. It's just like a cycle. Whenever the sun is at its maximum and putting out a lot of energy, that means that the world is going to receive more energy. Then what happens is that it's going to warm up a lot. And so the Pacific Ocean, which is like this huge, ginormous body of water, it's going to evaporate more during those times. That means there's going to be more rain around the world during those years. The opposite occurs during the period where the sun is going to be cooler. Less sunlight means less evaporation in the Pacific Ocean, and it means less rain and sometimes drought throughout the world. The periods of extreme rainfall are called El Nino, and it's going to have a lot of storms. And the periods of less rainfall or drought are called La Nina, which is its opposite. This is a pattern that affects global weather and obviously is also going to affect life because life is going to have to be coping with these periodic rises and fall in the amounts of water. So obviously going to affect the ecosystems around the world as well. Now, the same way that you have these local winds and you have monsoons and you have the El Nino that has everything to do with heat absorption, you also have currents at global proportions. The, the winds will circle from cold to hot areas and back just like they did in the land breezes and the other examples that we talked about. So that means that there's a pattern of wind distribution throughout the world. So on the equator, hot air will rise away from the equator in towards the, the colder areas of the world. Meanwhile, cold air from those areas is going to return towards the equator where it's going to be warmed up again. Now, each of these cells, or convection cells is what we call them, and that's what those things were too, on the, on the local winds and monsoons that we talked about. I was talking about convection cells, heat distribution by moving the particles which are actually hot. Now, this will distribute the heat from the equator towards the poles and the cold from the poles towards the equator. And you have this pattern also, lateral pattern, where, where you have these uh, trade winds carrying cold air from polar regions towards the center of the world in that pattern like this. And it's turning like that because of the fact that the Earth is turning, the Coriolis effect. So the, the winds are trying to go straight like this towards the middle, but the, part, the fact that the Earth is turning, by the time the wind gets there, it already hits somewhere else because the Earth is moving at the same time. So it's a Coriolis effect. We talk more about this when we do this in Earth-based science. Then on the... Temperate regions, you have another set of winds, hot winds coming from the equator carrying heat towards the poles. And we call those westerlies because they come from the west. And then on the poles, you have the polar easterlies, which are circulate cold air over there on the top as well. So these lateral and vertical patterns of wind distribute the heat throughout the world. Similarly, these winds will also drag the water of the oceans around and create what we call ocean conveyor belts where the heat of the oceans is transferred through the water. For example, the Gulf Stream carries hot water from the equator towards the north part of the Atlantic Ocean. And then when the water gets colder, it returns as the Canary Current towards the equator. A similar current called Kuroshio does the same thing in the North Pacific. And then the California Current brings cold back. So these patterns of distribution of heat, both through wind and through, through water, water currents and global wind patterns distribute the heat throughout the world.
if it wasn't for these patterns, it would be too hot in the equator and too cold in the poles for life to sustain itself. So thanks to these patterns of distribution of heat, life can actually exist. So again, what you need to know from all of this is that wind and water movement patterns, as well as things like the El Nino and specific heat, land absorbing more heat than water does, all of these things will help determine the weather and climate around the world because it will distribute the heat around and determine the way that the winds are blowing. All right? So just a little bit of review of climate patterns. You're not necessarily going to be tested on this, but it is important to understand why the, the, the climates are the way they are.